Hello, everybody. This is Rod Rojas for the Future Gravy channel. And uh, we have our uh, friend Daniel Krawitz here. Um, and we really appreciate that Daniel keeps coming back for more abuse. Uh, the, the Bitcoin community oh, tends please. to be very shy. <laughs> now, I like getting into arguments. To me, it's like, a, you know, combat. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to reach out to the rest of the community. Uh, yeah, guys, don't be so shy when I send you an invitation to come and speak. So, um, uh, Daniel, you were talking about an, uh, an article that you read about some price predictions, Bitcoin uh, price predictions. So this just showed up in my uh, Facebook feed, and this is an article for, on Cointelegraph that says, Legendary Bitcoin Trader. Master Luke predicts $15,000 Bitcoin within this year. And it's like, oh my God, like, what, what are you talking about? You can't, how can you possibly predict these things? Like, Bitcoin is totally crazy. You know, I think that it's going to go up, you know, eventually. But, you know. That's right. This guy is like. Let's see. Let's this quote. Uh, well, and wasn't what uh, Goldman Sachs ha has made all kinds of predictions. They keep moving their targets up or down depending on how the wind blows. It's it's really unbelievable. Yeah, and here's a quote from it. This guy says, uh, "Master Luke." Yeah. Um, he oh, it says he's something of a legend in the Bitcoin community. His claim to fame is that he called the top of the November 2013 Bitcoin bubble and the subsequent bear market. On December 6, with the price at 1100 he said, third day in a row, I wake up, see charts, and ask myself, is this the end? That's and right. third day in a row, answer is yes. End of first historical bullish trend 2010 to 2013. Oh, my God. This is just like a fortune teller. Like, you know, this is like some, some old woman with a crystal ball, and she's going like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, you you will see someone that you haven't seen in a long time. You know, some that, someone bad will show up. It's like, what are you <laughs> talking about? Come on, like this is just people don't have magic powers. That's to right. Say what's going to happen? Okay. Nobody can tell the future. And don't listen to these people. And if he's right, just so look. You know, I think that the markets are really telling about you know how people are feeling in some sense but it's all crazy it's all like like a crazy person okay just you got to stay out of that <laughs> that's right so uh, i you I, I read a few things about like uh, traders that actually make money and i actually they don't ever try to predict the future they are always reacting to what the market does they have they 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 follow trends. If the trend is going up, they just sort of go with it, and they have systems of stop loss. You know, stop losses set, so that if they're wrong, then they can limit their losses. And they are not guessing the future; they're reacting to what the market is doing. Yeah, um, you should never never try to. Uh, you you should try to make the vaguest prediction possible and win on off of that. Like if you're actually going to make a bet that Bitcoin is going to hit fifteen thousand dollars specifically within this year, like that's uh yes, you will make a ton of money if you happen to be correct. But it, right. it weren't you had no right you had no right to be. Like it's not there's no way you could really have known that, you know. In in it's a very uh like it's a, it's just an unnecessary risk to even think about this kind of stuff. That's right. So you think that uh, the community you said should detach itself from those people. Uh, you have also recently written an article, uh, which I am uh, putting in the show notes, uh, a link to it, uh, where you think that the community should detach itself also from these conflicts, specifically the, the scaling conflict? Sure. Well, um, so this is an article that is, uh, well, now it's called How to Face Bitcoin Forks. And I don't know, maybe I'll try to come up with a 
with a, a more interesting title, but um, the, the, the issue is like, if, if you are an investor in Bitcoin, you don't really have to take sides when, when there is a fork. Like if, if you do happen to know for real who's going to win somehow, then yeah, then put some money on one side, you know? But uh, if, if you own Bitcoins before, you all, and Bitcoin, you know, forks in two, you, you are invested in both sides automatically. Okay. Well, that's right. So, the safest thing is to do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That is, that is the safe route. That is like, that's playing, that's playing the game on easy mode, right? Cause you don't have to, you don't have to pick what's going to happen. You just say, well, one of them is going to win. So, you know, uh, I'll be fine either way. Now I have a few arguments in general. I'm, uh, I, I, I agree with you completely. Now there is a few things that um, that sort of uh, bother me about uh, about this, and one of them is that none of the mainstream wallets really supports forked, um, you know, coins. So right now. Um, uh, the people that that are not really aware of this uh, split, which is a lot of people, by the way, because I, I know a lot of Bitcoiners in Venezuela, they don't know what's happening, right? Oh, that's um, really funny. <laughs> that means yeah. they have money that they don't know about. <laughs> it, precisely, yeah. precisely. So, this, okay. so if no, the wallets are not supporting it, then a lot of people won't know what's happening, first of all, and they will be spending coins that have the, like they will spend, be spending Bitcoins yeah, that have right. not been split and, and it's a mess, right? Yeah, so the, you know, hopefully people don't just delete their private keys unthinkingly. Most, most wallets support hierarchical deterministic keys now. So, if, if you have the seed, you have every key ever that you ever used. Um, so, you know, that's not a perfect safeguard because definitely some people are going to delete their, their wallets. But if you right. have your seed, which, which, you should, which you should, if you are remotely responsible as a Bitcoiner, then you will be able to restore, restore everything for you know, a, some future version of your wallet or a different wallet uh, that supports forks better, and then you will be able to recover those funds. But that's a really funny point. That's <laughs> I can definitely see some funny things happening as, as a result of that now. <laughs> yeah, and these guys don't buy and hold. Like for a person who buys and holds, then there's no problem. The Bitcoins are in cold storage and the Bitcoin cash is there along with it. But these people are buying and selling stuff, are trading Bitcoin for Bolivars, and and uh, you know, so now they they have lost that that money that they could have had, right? Oh, that is really funny. Well, hey, I got another idea for you. <laughs> this one is really going to be unpopular. Uh, I think that when Bitcoin forks, the forks that the, the, there should not be relay protection. Okay. Like this is something that people have been worrying about because they say if you send a transaction that is intended for one chain, that people shouldn't be able to mine it on the other chain. But you I probably think mean that, you probably mean replay protection, oh, right? Wh what did I say? Relay, I think. Oh well, yeah, re replay. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, what, I, what? What? But you know what I mean. What I mean is you make a transaction. People say it's bad if the transaction is valid on both forks, and they call it an attack. If you, you know, if it, if a transaction is mined on on one one side, and then it is uh, moved over to the other side, they call that an attack, a replay attack. <laughs> so, um, but I don't think that that should be considered an attack. What I would like is for when Bitcoin forks that the two forks should kind of stay similar for a while. You know, I don't think that they should immediate, 
I don't think that they should immediately be, you know, separate communities. They, they, it should be, uh, it, it should be a, a controlled conflict where people have different ideas, but they're still overall cooperating to make the best Bitcoin. It's just now, now they're thinking like, we'll, we'll just try them both and see which is better, you know? Yeah, I think you can sort of forget about different camps cooperating. I think. <laughs> okay, well, just just wait wait a while, okay? Wait until I wait hope so. This has happened a few times cuz people are going to figure it out. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, and and I I mean, I like your idea of having competition between uh, between uh, coins and uh, I don't like uh, even though I have supported so far the technical decisions that the the core team has made. I I don't feel comfortable with that situation of having just one team that has no real competition. Would you care to uh, elaborate on that? If you agree with that, uh, sure. But first of all, well, let me finish what I was saying before. But oh, sure. If, if if it's not a replay attack, then somebody who doesn't know about Bitcoin Cash might still have his bitcoins if he trades a lot because the transactions would continue to be mined on both chains. I mean, that's not going to work forever, but, uh, you know, that, that helps him out a little bit. So, uh, so competition. Yeah, so w one thing that uh, I don't like about the Bitcoin community is that um, the, the core devs, you know, the people with software engineering skills who write the software uh, are are treated with respect that is out of proportion to to their skills to their contribution that's that's my opinion I, I would say like software engineering that means that's like somebody who knows how to build a house okay and to me like the way the Bitcoin community works now is it's like the, the people who know how to build the house are also expected to be the architect, which is, which is not what I want. Uh, I think that the investors should be the architect. Um, and, you know, I think that if a team of developers isn't interested in learning a lot about, you know, giving the investors their choice over what they build, then they, they should be replaced. Uh, so yeah, I like competition between different teams because that lets me pick which one, you know, listens to me the most. And of course, you know, if one team sucks at software engineering, then I don't like them. You know, I want I want a team that is good at software engineering and listens to me. Okay? And it, eventually that that will come along as long as competition is allowed. That's right. It's the difference between intelligent design and Darwinian uh, evolution as you were pointing out in your in your article, right? Sure. Well, to me it is kind of like a, a Darwinian process except I'm I am providing the the fitness uh, the fitness chart, you know. So uh, if I just des decide I like Bitcoin Cash a little bit better, then I can buy a little bit more. So I am making it more fit, um, and I'm showing what I like with my choices. But you know, that being said, I'm not going to make a big decision. I have not I have not done anything, by the way, but. Uh, I, I, you know, if I make a decision, it's going to be a small fraction of my total investment in Bitcoin, because to me, I think like I, I don't, I don't want to be loyal to either side. I just want to give one side a little bit of encouragement, if if I like what they're up to, you know, and if they get better, then maybe I'll add a little more. That's that's kind of how I look at. Right. So basically, we're talking about not necessarily eliminating conflict, but transferring the conflict from the rhetorical trying to convince people to the competition side of things. Oh, absolutely. The well, economical you know, I, side. 
I think that people should have skin in the game if they want to say what's going to happen. And, you know, by the way, you know, many core devs are also investors in Bitcoin. So to that extent, you know, they, they get to have their say a as much as anybody who has lots of Bitcoins, you know. But, um, but I, you know, I don't, uh, they, they, they don't get a special privilege because they're the developers as, as far as being leaders is concerned. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I was just say saying that uh, perhaps rather than eliminating conflict, basically it's just removing conflict from one area and putting it into another area where it can oh. actually work. Right. So, so skin in skin in the game. That's what I was saying. Yeah. So you know, uh, the the if if there are going to be um, two two camps that disagree about you know, what Bitcoin is going to do, the the best way to resolve the problem is to uh, let, let people uh, put their money where their mouth is. And it, it is better if people can do that in, it, it's better if, if it's easy for people to do that. It's better if, if uh, you know, I can just, you know, log in somewhere and set up you know uh, a futures contract or or set up a, a trade uh, you know uh, with a stop loss or something and then the, the market knows what I think uh, it's not it's not bad if there is a, a split and and there is a, a conflict on the open market to me that's just that's just like parliamentary procedure except that the Bitcoin world is like a very loud room where everybody is screaming insanities all the time. It's not like, uh, you know, it's not like Robert's rules, but it's, it is, it's, it's still similar. <laughs> At least it's loud to us who are inside. Right. Yeah. <laughs> My experience with the Venezuelan Bitcoiners was very, very revealing. Uh, they're, they're completely oblivious. They, they have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, why, why should they? Like the whole point is that Bitcoin should just work and you, you can use it to, you know, evade the authorities and you, you shouldn't have to think about it, you know. And I, I, I would like it if only, only in the investors who, um, yeah, it would, it would be best if most people didn't have to think about it. Like if, if you really care about the design decisions being made, then, then yeah, you should, you know, you should be able to put your money where your mouth is. But at the same time, you know, people who don't care shouldn't shouldn't be uh, inconvenienced at all. And and that's, that's also that really that also is why there shouldn't be we shouldn't think of replays as an attack. We should actually, if there is a fork, we really should want it to be kind of the same for a while eventually it'll diverge but that you know that that'll be that means the community is you know has decided. and would that represent like i don't know the technical aspect so i might be saying something very stupid here but would that be like printing money like will the money supply of bitcoin because of the two bitcoins would there be a doubling? No, great question because I have got into so many arguments about this. I, to me, this is like uh, anyway. No, you don't sound stupid because lots of people have the same problem. Okay, um, but to me, like they, there are still twenty-one million bitcoins, where a bitcoin is defined as one unit of Bitcoin Core plus one unit of Bitcoin Cash. You have one of each of them then you have one Bitcoin. That's that's my definition. And to me, that makes sense because before, you know, before if I had one Bitcoin, it, it's like it just split in two, into two different things. So that if you put them back together, that should be one Bitcoin. So, I, you know, as long as a new chain, or I should say, as long as one one side of a fork is not you know, changing the money supply schedule, then um, 
you know, then I say there's still 21 million bitcoins. And, and by the way, if somebody did try to change the supply, that I don't think that that fork would stay valuable for very long. So, you know, that's not something that I'm worried about. That's that's also something people have gotten into arguments with me about. Uh, but but no, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can in, inflate the money supply by making forks because anybody who tries it is not, is going to be disliked by the investors. Right. So and um, um, so would the replay, the lack of a replay protection, would ensure that one of the two coins dies? Is that correct? Uh, Whereas no, right I, now, Bitcoin Cash will stay alive forever if if only a few people keep it alive. Oh, well, no. I mean, I don't think that uh, the, 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 no, the, the replay attack thing, I, I think that that's more for, for convenience. That's, that's, what, that's what will make things easier for most people. But um, uh, I, I don't think that has any relationship to whether whether one of them is uh, going to die eventually i mean i think i think that eventually one side will be have such a low value that people will stop caring about it so like one thing that people have talked to me about on twitter is a coin that i had never heard of before called clams and so apparently if you had if you had bitcoins before clams was created you, or Litecoin or Dogecoin, I think was the other one. Then you also have clams, <laughs> and it's so like, I well, guess we have clams. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. So if you kept all of your keys, you can redeem your clams, which I think I will not do because they're they're not worth very much. <laughs> so so um, so eventually, one of the chains will be like that. It'll be so tiny that you know nobody will care about it anymore. Um, so basically, you will be able to spend both coins in both chains for a while only, and then uh, the winning coin will take over, but it but the other coin won't necessarily die right away. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I don't think that. I, I just think it'll be a gradual process where one of them eventually becomes small, so small that it's sort of like you forget about it. Um, so yeah, technically, technically, my definition of Bitcoin should include clams. So I should have said one Bitcoin is one unit of core plus one unit of cash plus one clam. But it's like, well, there's really not much of a difference between that and what I said before. It's like I was mostly right the first time. <laughs> That's OK. So since you're talking about that, why don't you give us your definition of, of an altcoin uh, versus like uh, some people are arguing about uh, Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash. Which one is the altcoin? And your your view was a little different from other people. OK, so to me, like the reason like here, here's the issue, like if, if you have two coins that have different Genesis blocks and a totally different history, you know, well, say one is created later, like say this one has been running for a while and then this one comes later. You're, you're talking about a new coin that's just really not very useful compared to the older one, just because the older one has a bigger network and, and it connects you with more people. It, it's, in, it's inherently more useful to have a currency that connects you to more people, ir irrespective of the... Um, the, the technological differences of each. And to me, like the technical differences between most of the different coins are so tiny that it's like, I, I you know, it doesn't matter that very much. So, it, so people who create the altcoin and emphasize the technological differences and, you know, try to sell it like a real investment, I, I, don't, I don't think that they're, I mean, I think that they're telling me something that's not true. Like, I think my interests are not to care about the technological difference very much and to just ignore them and, and keep the Bitcoins because Bitcoin has the bigger network, you know? So right. uh, I think that, you know, the, the whole altcoin uh, fad <laughs> is, right. is running um, 
you, you know, with very unrealistic ideas about what's actually in the interest of investors. Okay. So what I would like is for people to stop making altcoins and stop, you know, stop trying to tell me that, you know, you've got a better option for me than, than keeping the bitcoins because you don't, you know. Um, but when, so, so that the, the important thing is altcoins are a bad decision for me. Well, the, the important thing is there is a bad decision and I want to have a word for them. So I call them altcoins. Now, the problem with Bitcoin forks is choosing about buying one fork or the other is a very different investment decision than choosing whether to buy an altcoin versus keeping bitcoins. Um, and the difference is that when the split happens, it happens at the same time. Well, you know, well, I mean, it's just one time, it's one event, and the two sides are identical. So everybody, they, well, they, they, they have the same connections between the same people. So they have, the, the network effect is kind of canceled out. Okay, so um, when, when the split happens, the, the technological differences matter a lot more. And then it's then it's interesting to me to think about which one I like better, like a SHA-256 versus script or, you know, what whatever. I don't think that that's actually very important, but some people are, are interested in that. So, uh, that, but that's when technological differences become interesting to me. So I don't want to call that an altcoin because we're talking about a different kind of decision. We're talking about something that could be a good decision. I mean, you know, given that this is Bitcoin, probably not, but like the, the odds are, are better. It's qualitatively different from the, the altcoins, okay? So I don't want to call forks of Bitcoin an altcoin. I, I, I want to call them something else. So what I called them in my article is I said that, you know, there's one Bitcoin, you know, there's one Bitcoin and then the, the two sides are child coins. So they are children of the original Bitcoin. And from an investment standpoint, I would like investors to treat them, you know, as equally as possible and to sort of give them both a fair chance to compete and see who, who does better, you know? That's great, Daniel. Um, now, do you, is there anything else you want to add regarding to your article? Or I wanted to talk to you about the price action right now, if you don't mind. Uh, no, I don't have anything else. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about the price action. Yeah, let's look into the crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. actually, I'm, I'm more interested about uh, a concept that you put forth uh, a while back. I don't know if it's original from you or if you took it from somebody else. That doesn't matter, really. Uh, but the term hyper-Bitcoinization. Oh, um, okay. No, I actually apparently made said that word first. At least I don't know of anybody else. To me, it doesn't. It's not a very original coinage. It's kind of like the most obvious possible word that you could make. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I remember when I first posted my article on it, some people on Butcoin tried to make fun of me for making up words. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's like the most, like, uh, of course, that's what you call it. Um, but, but yeah, so I think that, you know, as, as Bitcoin gets bigger to, it gets more useful, at least in some ways, in very important ways. Um, you know, as as if if as if the bandwidth is capped, then we get higher transaction prices, so that's less useful. But the the network is, effect is still very useful, and and the ability to hold value, um, you know, regardless of what what your nation of origin says that you should do. Those are all very useful. Um, uh, and Bitcoin gets more useful as it gets bigger because the Bitcoin network connects you to more people. And I'm not, I'm not talking about like computers. I'm not talking about 
full nodes. I'm talking about just people who use Bitcoin for different things. And the it, market cap, right? Yeah, and anybody who is, uh, who is an investor, e even if they're just an investor for a few minutes, that's, that's still good. It's better, that's not as good as somebody who is a long-term investor, but you know, you're, you're still good either way. <laughs> um, so, uh, so um, and at the same time, the currencies that people are leaving to get into Bitcoin are becoming less useful for the same reason. Because you're talking about people who, you're talking about a smaller network for the dollar or, you know, the ruble or the, uh, the, uh, the, yon, uh, the yon. I, oh God, I don't know. I was trying to think of the Chinese currency and I think I would embarrass myself if I tried to pronounce it, but. <laughs> but well, yeah, but I mean, we, we say yuan, I guess, in, in English. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I just read it, read about it. I don't uh, talk about it that much. But so they're leaving these, the networks for these national currencies. So they're becoming less useful. Um, maybe, you know, when Bitcoin was small, the dollar was becoming less useful, at, you know, at a very low rate as a result of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin had very little effect. But now Bitcoin is getting pretty big. I mean, it's, it, it, I, I, I would bet that you could measure the effect of Bitcoin on the dollar now. Uh, I, I haven't seen anybody doing that, but it, to me that seems like that should, be, that should be something that you should see by now. Um, and and it's not just um, the network which is which is super important, but also the the market cap. Because if you have a currency that is worth just a million dollars, then a, a large investor cannot invest into it because it's so small. Right. It, sure. So, it seems like a paradigm, but so you have to you have to think of it as a weighted network. So if you've got a, a in graph theory in mathematics, you can have a a, a weighted graph where the different nodes have uh, bigger numbers, well, bigger or smaller numbers attached to them. And then, you know, there are different, different costs to traversing the network in, in different ways, right? I, I guess usually the weights are on the, um, the, uh, the edges of the graph, but, but I'm, I'm thinking of the nodes as people. So, you know, you would assign their net worth to the nodes that makes them, uh, you know, that makes them better, better nodes. Uh, <laughs> so they're not, they're not better people, but they're just, they're better for Bitcoin. Okay. <laughs> for sure. For yeah. sure. So, um, so yeah, bigger investors have a bigger effect on Bitcoin. And if they're willing to put a lot of money in they're, you know, they're putting more, they're, they're adding more demand than other people are. So they're making, they're doing more to make the network bigger. So, so yeah, you can look at the market cap as, roughly speaking, the the overall size of the uh, the the network that I'm talking about. That's right. And uh, if I could add to that, you were talking about the effects of Bitcoin on the dollar, and I would say that. Uh, you will start to measure also to be able to measure the effects of Bitcoin on the stock markets because um, when my grandma was alive, people didn't speculate in the stock stock market because they had deflationary currencies. So they just had gold and silver coins, uh, you know, in their backyard or whatever, uh, and uh, they didn't have a, a stock brokerage account or they didn't invest in businesses. Um, oh, you know, I would love to see that. I mean, the stock market is not for normal people. The stock market is for people who like insanity. Okay, and that's that's like me. I am definitely uh, I definitely like being around insanity better than most people do. You know, <laughs> but you know, the stock market is for people who like insanity. And if you're not one of those people, you shouldn't have to get into it. And you know, and people say like, oh, you know, the stock market would crash, like the people wouldn't invest enough if they could just hold all of their savings in gold and the stock market would crash. Well, good. I mean, 
that they shouldn't be there. Like it's not good for them. Um, if, and if, I think it's a non sequitur uh, because a lot of these companies, they, they don't even uh, pay dividends or make any money. Like Amazon is huge in the stock market. And it has been losing money, I, I believe, ever since it was created. Yeah. Oh, I have to recommend a book. It's called Disrupted. And uh, I don't remember the name of the author, but it it's about a Newsweek journalist. Well, he's the author. He's a former Newsweek journalist. And he joins a uh, crazy tech startup. It is so similar to Bitcoin. It doesn't, he doesn't talk, he mentions Bitcoin once in the book, I think, but the environment he's in is so similar. Like everybody in this company is crazy and it's, it's basically like a cult and everybody there has to say like, uh, they have to follow the company culture rules. Like, <laughs> and, oh, and they have a slogan. The slogan is uh, one plus one equals three. It's so Orwellian, right? <laughs> it's, but it's so much like Bitcoin because they're all just saying like, like, oh, you know, we're going after our dreams. Uh, we're trying to get get rich. You know, we're trying to produce something great. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, like the only point, of, the only reason that your company is viable is that there are too many stupid people in the stock market to sell to when you do your IPO. That's it. Like the whole, like the whole point of these startup companies is to do a successful IPO. And to me, like that, that makes you a scam company inherently. Like if, if, you know, if that's all you care about, then that's just not what a company is for, you know? Um, but you know, the smart investors, they want to find somebody who's going to do a great art IPO and then leave. Uh, and that's, that's smarter, but it's not, it's not good. <laughs> and it's not, and, and the only reason they can do that is there, there are too many people who don't really know what's going on, you know, and they're, they're willing to buy some dumb IPO for a company that can never really be profitable. And I don't know about Amazon.com. I mean, <laughs> I guess I would assume that they should be profitable at some point, right? Uh, I, uh, I mean, marginally. I, know, maybe not. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't assume that. I should say, like, like, if there is a stock market crash, I would imagine that Amazon would be one of the companies that survived it, you know? Well, it, 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 I, I believe that the way it works is that some people there have stock options and then they can sell their stock and then get their money that way um, or something like that, like the people in upper management. Uh, but actually, the company loses money on a regular basis. Um, and uh, it's just incredible. I mean, so, I love Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> Something well, like that. Yeah. And that has to stop at some point because I mean, you know, people have been saying that that uh, fiat money will end, you know, uh, uh, they've been saying it for decades and it somehow never happens. I don't know. Oh, uh, oh my god, it's going to be that sounds so great. Like <laughs> you're going to people amazing. are going to be like, "Why would I invest in a stupid company when I can just securely store my wealth forever in Bitcoin?" And I'll be like, ha, you guys said it was a risky investment before, dummies. <laughs> That'll be <Exactly>. great. <laughs> and I think I think this change of mind is gonna start happening. There are there are millennials, you know, people that buy big Bitcoin just for their video game, uh, you know, uh, things, and they are starting to see this deflationary currency, uh, you know, multiply in their smartphones. And yeah. I think this is gonna change people's behavior. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, in the future, uh, you know, parents will, uh, they'll lose their life savings and their, their teenage children will be like, oh, well, you know, I did buy some Bitcoins a while ago, so uh, we, we can use that. Don't worry. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be an amazing uh, wealth transfer. Yeah. Oh, my God. A wealth transfer from old people to children. That sounds terrible. Wow. <laughs> I don't know about that one, <laughs> but definitely, definitely from, <coughs> from, uh, from, uh, definitely to, I, I don't know, people, I, I don't want to say, I, I, I mean, I think that 
people who are interested in, in, in Bitcoin are, are, you know, making a good decision, obviously. Uh, but if, if Bitcoin does succeed, then it, it, would, it would definitely be, be the kind of thing that people would be interested in uh, if they wanted to store their savings for a long time and not worry about losing everything, you know? That's right. That's right. And uh, regarding this hyper Bitcoinization in in your uh, in that old article, you said that it could po potentially be a very quick process. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it, remember when I said that the dollar is getting worse and Bitcoin is getting better. Well, um, that's kind of a, a self reinforcing process, isn't it? Because if the dollar gets because that that makes Bitcoin better relative to the dollar, you know. It's not like um, now, like you're even better off now switching from dollars to bitcoins than you were a few years ago, uh, at, at least in in an immediate sense, you know. Um, do it, you think a uh, hundred? Do you still think that a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin uh, back in 2013 and a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin now? Um, uh, which one would you take? Oh, well, I mean, what, what, see, what matters is like how, how much the, how much into the future you're planning. Cause if I was going to say like the money that I want for, you know, the next couple of months to pay the rent, then clearly I would say Bitcoin is better now than, than in the past. But if That's we're talking, I mean, but obviously Bitcoin is not, you know, it, it can't possibly be a better investment because it's more expensive because its upside potential is less. Of course, of course. But uh, but that's that's exactly the point that I was driving at is that a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin now does a lot more um, and is a lot more valuable from from an from a speculative standpoint. If you had, you know, um, uh, uh, 2020 hindsight, uh, you know, uh, if you could see the the future and so on, then you would know that it would be a a, 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 a speculation, right? A big speculation to put money in Bitcoin uh, several years ago. Um, but uh, aside from that, I think that Bitcoin is so much more valuable now. It's uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, just look at uh, how the, the the software has changed. Like, look at how much more usable Bitcoin is. Like, you you have software now that people can use, and you know, maybe they not not really know anything about how Bitcoin works. Like, they don't have to know about private keys and you know. Uh, um, and uh, you know Merkle trees. I guess you never really needed to know about that, but you, you know it's it's more more intuitive. It's more like just you know now I have the bitcoins, and uh, it, it pretty much tells me what I need to do with them. You know, that's right. Well, Daniel, um, it has been a great chat. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. Um, not really. I mean, just you know. I don't know. Like, I, I really feel like, like Bitcoiners are are very uh, nervous constantly, when really, there's no there's no reason to be. Like, there's there's always sort of been an attitude in Bitcoin, like maybe the whole thing could you know explode at at any moment. I mean, and it's it has come back with with some of the uh, some of the rhetoric that I've seen concerning the fork, but it's like. You know, I don't think so. Like, it seems like uh, it seems like the fork is going to be fine. Um, and I would like to see, like, if you're somebody who wanted to make an altcoin, I think you should make a fork instead. That's really a better decision. And don't let people don't let people tell you that you're being antisocial by doing that. That's I I, I like you better. <laughs> well, I certainly enjoyed the windfall. Oh yeah. Oh ah, that is something that I 
uh, yeah, I wanted to say something about that because yeah, all investors should be happy, like because the sum of the two coins is well, the moment the moment the split happened, the sum of the two coins was greater than the the one coin originally. So I'm not talking about like what's happened since then, which has been really great, but like I'm like the moment that the split happened, everybody got richer. So that's good. Like that's what that's what people should want. If if the sum is less, that means it was a bad decision and investors are unhappy. But if it's more, that means investors are excited and they wanna they want to watch the conflict. It's gonna be like a football game for investors, you know. Um, yeah, like I said before, I just hope that more wallets uh, start supporting this type of thing. Well, yeah, I would sure like to see that, but I think they will because I don't know. To me, what I'm saying obviously makes sense. So, so and eventually somebody is going to build something that build something that that teaches people what I'm saying, and then everybody will say, "Oh, yeah, of course I like this better." Because I tell you, I tried. Uh, well, I succeeded. I uh, splitting my coins this week. I tell you, it was really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. I think I got some gray hair just from that. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah. I'm not even. I'm not even going to bother with that uh, anytime soon. Or I, well, I will be working on software that'll that'll help eventually. That's definitely that's great. On, in in my pipeline, but um, you know we've got too much to do on, right at the moment. <laughs> that's great. Being busy is good, Daniel. Thank yeah. you so much for being with us today again. Okay. Thanks. Well, thanks for inviting me. And I'll see you later. Great discussion. Yeah, same here. Bye. Bye.